Hey everyone, it's me HawkeyeG and I'm here with another video. Today's video is a campaign army composition guide with demonstrations and the race we'll be composing and demonstrating for is Kislev. While it's no longer a recommended starting race as of patch 1.1, it is still a pretty popular one. They have a good amount of flexibility with their roster to adapt to different situations, they have some decent specializations that you can shift into throughout the campaign, and they also have a pretty standard overall composition format that you can use as a baseline as well pretty easily. As always, if you're enjoying the videos, please like and subscribe, and leave any comments or questions you have in the comment section down below. Now, if this is your first time watching one of my army composition and demonstration guides, I'll explain how I have them set up in the following section. Uh, but if you're already familiar with how I do these videos, please just skip that section and move on to the next one. With that being said, let's start the show. So the short version of the explanation is that I use the custom battle form, or in this game, the verse AI battle, to demonstrate these kinds of armies on normal battle difficulty, where I pit them against an enemy army of equal tech level and approximately equivalent cost. And I base the compositions on what would be theoretically possible at different stages of the campaign. So I'll break that down a little further. So in order to break these compositions up into different stages of the campaign, uh, I kind of use a formula based on the settlement level and building browser, right? So when we get to our tier three settlement as whoever we're playing as, right? I always work as though we have two military buildings available to us. Uh, it should apply, you know, the campaigns and uh, races in this game are a bit more unique in this setting. But generally speaking, you would think that across any province, even if you only have a two settlement province by tier three, you should be able to have two military buildings bare minimum. So we make our compositions based off of that, uh, and then we scale it up as we go, right? Tier four takes a while to get to, so that's gonna be like our, our early game compositions are up to tier three units, two military buildings. Tier four, then I would add a third potential military building, and of course, tier four units. And then when I talk about late game, I'm just gonna say anything goes. By the time we're talking about late game stuff, you could theoretically combine whatever and have multiple tier five settlements. So when I say theoretical compositions, when I talk about early game, mid game, and late game, that's how I'm trying to break it up. It works a little differently in this game where I'd say, you know, your early game compositions, you might try to revise your army by turn 30 or so, but you might still be kind of fiddling with that army or not have the funds or the time to replace everything and get to tier four by turn 60. I think you probably will, but it can definitely fluctuate. So it's harder to define early, mid and late game in this campaign, but just think about it in terms of your settlement level. Now, of course, the other and probably more significant part of this guide is using the custom battle game mode in order to lay out and demonstrate compositions, right? So we'll start in the campaign map. I'll talk about I would you would want this building and this building in order to create this composition, right? I put the battle on normal difficulty in part because that's what I play the game on, uh, but also because... This allows us to evaluate these kinds of compositions in a neutral setting, right? Rather than setting it up on the campaign map where you have all your bonuses from your Lord and perhaps research weighing in and playing a factor. This, this is about as close to a true neutral situation as we can get, right? Really similar funding for these armies, similar difficulty, right? We're not kind of working into or against. So it, it's all theoretical, right? If we, if we can do well in this setting, we should still, if we do really well in this setting, we should do even better on the campaign with Lord boot bonuses and research bonuses. And even if it's go, even if you go up in battle difficulty, you should still be able to manage, or at least we can talk about what kinds of compositions are viable there. So I, I set up a composition in the custom battle form, talk about why and how I selected the units. I might briefly touch on what we're going to be facing against the enemy. And then I'm going to go through an actual replay of me playing out a battle between these two armies so we can see how the units work in practice after talking about it in theory and give people a better idea of how to actually use the units instead of just saying, you know, this is your line holder, this is your damage dealer, stuff like that, right? So hopefully that makes sense. With all that being said, we're going to jump into the campaign map and we're going to talk briefly about what turn one looks like and how our compositions will work there. So like I said, jumping into the campaign map here, uh, we're just starting out on turn one. You don't have a lot of options. You'll probably have a barracks depending on who you're playing as, uh, but really we're just gonna be spamming out Cossars and the key is gonna be trying to use whatever unique starting units you get to give yourself just the slightest advantage and win that way. 
Alright, so what I've got here is just a little bit of a, you know, theoretical early game composition. This isn't an exact replica of Tsarina Katarin's army, but it's pretty close to what you'd start with, right? And you can see, we just fill in all the gaps with Kossars as much as we can. Now, I can't demonstrate against Greenskins or Skaven or Norska, unfortunately, because we don't have Immortal Empires yet, so I don't have the ability to do that. I'm going to try to mirror the sort of matchups we'll be taking as best as I can, however. Uh, I find that you fight a lot of Norskins in the early game, so we'll try to build a little bit around that. There's also lots of fighting the demons. The, the exception is, of course, Boris, right? Boris Ursus is going to fight Greenskins and Skaven. Can't necessarily demonstrate that, but in the early game, we're going to just go against the Kislev kind of mirror matchup. This is something for at least two out of the three campaigns you're going to be dealing with, kind of an army that they're going to have. So let's take a look at this replay and see what this uh, plays out like. Now, I really don't want to spend too much time on this replay. Uh, it's going to be kind of straightforward, kind of boring. Mirror matchups are, you know, kind of that work that way. So you can see I'm trying to position, you know, some of these extra units. The Snow Leopard's going to be great for taking down the Dervishes. And just in general, having these kind of extra units to be able to run around or distract the opponent, you know, even if it's not to directly confront them, but just to kind of get them to chase you around a little bit, that can be an effective strategy. And of course, we have to approach them. We've got kind of a basic checkerboard formation here. And really the key is just to make sure that we're focus firing down our opponents, right? We want to try to take these, like, you know, you're just going to be trading shots, right? And we don't really have a lot of other specialty units. Um, so use your magic to your advantage. Try to make sure that whenever you can, you start target firing units down um, to get rid of, all, like, to get them off the battlefield so you can kind of eventually get a numbers advantage. And, uh, yeah, I, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, right? We can see I'm starting to flank with the cavalry here. We've got the Snow Leopard kind of waiting to see what their cost of like dervishes do, because if I can have this move through to intercept them, I'm trying to keep the Lord in good position. And as you can see here, right, we just got some focus firing from our archers to try and whittle their numbers down and give us the numbers advantage that way. So let's move ahead a bit. So we can get a couple of sweeps in here. I got this cavalry unit to kind of hit both of these Kossars here, and it also disrupts their formation a little bit, where a lot of the time the AI will try to retreat their archers when you're charging them, so it can be really useful for that. Uh, it's a good way of getting in there. Again, we see the Snow Leopard here trying to contest these Kossified Dervishes, keep them off our front lines a little bit. Did lose a Kossar unit, but that's the great thing about this turn one, like, early game spam. We're just spamming out basic cost arguments, right? And so they're extremely easy to replace and can be replaced at any settlement. And with that, this fight's pretty much over. Again, uh, using the cavalry to kind of, whatever spare units you have, if you can either attack isolated targets or trick them into, you know, attacking some of your, more trying to like chase your isolated targets, that's really the key here, that and the target firing. So I don't want to harp on that too much, but yeah, you can see here, right, we get pretty good dam uh, damage value from the cavalry. Not as good from the Snow Leopard, but that's probably more due to the value of the unit. Um, but you can see here, we still get some pretty solid value with a lot of these Kossars. So really, this is all you need for the early game, and you can see it was very successful here. All right, we're back on the campaign map, and now we're going to talk about early game compositions. So what that means, again, is anything up to Tier 3 and we can have potentially two different military buildings in our setup here. Now, I think that all you really need is the one for Kislev. You just need the barracks, you put armored Kossars in there, you put regular Kossars in there, you're pretty much done. If you want to consider the Patriarch building, the other military building, you can, because it's very important to get heroes. I think that heroes are one of the more important features of Kislev. You can get your Patriarchs and you can get both the troop replenishment on them and you can get them to use their actual AoE heal spell. Uh, you can also get Frost Maidens through the research initially. So getting some heroes in the early game and just kind of having a very standardized composition that can react to whatever is going to be good. We could get some Strautzi, but they're pretty expensive. We might also get we at least have cavalry as an available option or alternative. I don't know if I'd really tried to get into any of these other units just at tier three yet, but we'll kind of look towards that in the future. Uh, the problem with cavalry is that it's good tools for combating enemy archers and artillery. They're effective at flanking or rear charging enemy infantry, but we just aren't going to have a lot of that, right? If 
if we're going up against Kislev, we're gonna they're gonna have like the kind of units to counter that a little bit, or you know, in a mirror matchup, I don't know if this is gonna give us the advantage. It could be okay against Greenskins if they don't bring cavalry of their own. It's gonna be best against Skaven, but really the Greenskin and Skaven comments apply a lot more specifically to Boris Ursus, right? And and if we're talking about dealing with the Norska, it can be okay, but they're gonna have like the anti-large javelin units and stuff like that. I'd I think that it's an option, but I'm not going to showcase it here because I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I don't think that you need it. You just need to get the heroes, get a Frost Maiden, and have uh, just spam out Armored Cossars and regular Cossars. So let's go look at that. Okay, so here we are looking at, you know, what I think is, is basically the foundational composition for Kislev for most of the rest of the game. Uh, this is probably a little light on Armored Kossar. I think in general, like a 2 to 1 ratio of damage units to line holders is good. However, it depends on who you're going up against. Uh, again, I mentioned Kislev's flexibility, and especially for you as a player, if you find that you're getting overwhelmed by the opponent you're facing, you're, you're dying too frequently to flanking units, or you aren't able to kind of kill the enemy before they reach your front line, then I would recommend that you start trading out some of these units for more frontline units, right? Even even a one-to-one -one ratio is still a pretty healthy balance, especially in Total War Warhammer 3. Now, in this battle, I used a little bit more Kossar. We've got a couple Patriarchs in here, and I actually have the heal ability on them. I wanted to do this battle with the uh, vigor, reduct like vigor Preservation buff, but the, the heal really is just so good. Um, it's so universal. We don't have a ton of abilities on our spellcasters yet, so it's pretty simple. And we're going up against a Nurgle army. You know, in the early game, you're going to be fighting most likely some, you know, moderately to lightly armored melee troops. You're probably going to be fighting some moderately armored cavalry and some spam. Uh, it's going to differentiate whether, you know, if you're fighting greenskins, these are your goblins, and these are your orc style, right? If you're fighting Norska, you might not see as many of these monstrous units, and you're going to see more heavy infantry, but they still won't be as heavily armored, so I think this is an okay example here to show. Now, let's get into the battle and see how it plays out. So again, I went with a pretty standard checkerboard formation here. I, of course, forgot to plant one of the units in there, so we got to scoot them over. Uh, but you'll see that won't really matter. Now, I also noticed that they're sending some of their, you know, kind of cavalry type, the monstrous, you know, war beasts off to the flanks. So I've started to rotate some of our infantry here so that they'll be able to just kind of automatically shoot at the sides. Uh, I still want to manually target them onto attacking those in order to make sure that they're shooting right away, but just kind of having them facing the right direction early on and setting them up accordingly. It just makes things a little bit easier here. Uh, and you can see, actually, I did swap out this... In this replay, I did end up swapping out. So we have six armored Kossars, and we have seven, eight regular Kossars. Yeah, so like I was talking about, coming closer to a one-to-one -one ratio uh, of line holders versus damage dealers, probably better off, especially in this game. I think in the previous title it was a little different, but anyway... So they're kind of approaching our lines, getting a lot of damage done on these flankers, especially this one Cox Rider is basically already eliminated, but they're going to start to reach our lines. So we start throwing down some spells here, trying to get some damage out. I'm not microing the archers too much here. I'm just kind of letting them do their work, focusing on getting spells out, getting people in the right place, getting our heroes engaged, using some of their abilities, and especially trying to cast spells uh, anywhere that there's a big blob or a certain chance. Right, we've got this pox, or the plague toads kind of trying to flank, and so that's that's the kind of stuff you want to focus on, right? If, if you can, set your archers to you know fire and forget as much as possible, and make sure that you are anticipating their flanks, moving and repositioning your units to attack them on the flanks things like that are really important right being able to kind of catch this and have an enemy have like one of your units set up to start shooting them as soon as they enter right trying to anticipate your enemy's movements uh, especially if you're going with the more defensive style and kind of doing the checkerboard of course our armored cossars are going to start taking a lot of damage our patriarchs in there maybe a little bit too deep He's going to start taking some damage as well, but having a Patriarch in there makes for a great target for some of these Ice Spells where you can really do a lot of damage. Again, we're still setting up on the flanks here, trying to give our troops uh, you know, a good advantageous angle to shoot at them. Another big Hailstorm on them, and you can see they're pretty much dwindling. We've taken a decent bit of damage, um, but they brought some serious units here too. 
and uh, even the survivability of these patriarchs, right? And you can see this one's at full health. I don't know if it'll tell us. Yeah, we have one use left of the heal, and so that just shows you how powerful that can be. I've, I've had this guy engaged in combat the whole time, and um, he still was able to ride it out using that heal. And so all we have left now is for their lord to decay, and that's the end of the battle. So looking at the post game here. We did take quite a bit of damage on our front line, and, and so you can see that's why in this replay I ended up, I redid it and decided to bring that extra front line. Uh, because otherwise, if your front line is taking too much damage, it's going to kind of slow down your campaign a little bit. But with two patriarchs in this army, we should easily have the casualty replenishment rate to recover this kind of damage and be able to keep pushing forward turn after turn. So that was our early game composition. We're now going to look at mid game compositions. Again, mid game, I'm going to consider as soon as you get your tier four building, your like settlement capital constructed, we're going to have room to add in a third military building in order to make our compositions from. And we're going to, of course, have access to any tier four units as well. It's hard to define what turn this is around. Usually in the previous game, I would have defined it as turn 50 to 100. But in this game, it might be more like like 50 to 90 something like that maybe even earlier than that uh, but that's not important as much as just recognizing it's the tier 4 building and the military structures now we already have our core of armored cossars and regular cossars right so what kinds of things can we add into that that are going to kind of make a difference in our gameplay here i think that the three pieces that are going to be the most valuable to us as new tools to use here one of them is the little grom and we'll find compositions with that. One of them is the War Bear Riders. Again, we'll find compositions with that. And another one is actually the White Light War Sleds. So we'll find compositions with that. Now, before I move on to the next composition, I want to touch on one other thing here, and that is going to be corn specifically, uh, but more generally, how we can kind of adjust our compositions as Kislev to compensate for different things, right? Like I said, one of the big aspects of the Kislev uh, army composition is that it's flexible. We've got kind of our core of armored and regular Kossars, but really this is more like line holders and missile units. So going up against corn and trying to do some replays for them I really struggled to see success and and I mean this you know I didn't want to give us like an easy army of corn to fight against this this is kind of a, this is a suitable composition for you know the rules I set for what kind of buildings you'd have access to even though the skull cannon might not fit perfectly you know if we're not bringing artillery that's a good thing for them to have and they're it's nice for corn when they can sit back and have the advantage but the, the biggest obstacle that you'll have if you're fighting against corn or corn units is going to be their armor, right? Our Kossars just do not have the armor piercing that they need. Even though armored Kossar guns have better armor piercing, they have super limited ammunition. So this is where stuff like the War Bear Riders are going to be really useful. And even shrinking your army down to have fewer Kossars and more Strautzi or more War Bear Riders, I think is going to be the key here, right? So I I just want to make the overall point about flexibility with your armies. If you're going to be fighting enemies who, instead of being numerous and low armored, are going to be less numerous but more highly armored, right? That's where you want to convert more into Strautzi. These are going to be your key armor piercing units. Uh, obviously, War Bear Riders are going to be a good tool for that, and some little Groms are, but you know, you can only bring so many little Groms. This is also where converting into more line holding units is going to at least be a little bit more effective, give you more time to use your magic abilities on them. But it's just something that I wanted to touch on, right? I, you're going to struggle if you go up against this. I can beat that army of corn with an army that looks like this, uh, but it's definitely not going to be as good of an outcome. So anyway, I just, just wanted to touch on that. Something to keep in mind is the flexibility of these compositions and converting into, you know, less quantity, more quality when you need to. All right, so here we have our first composition, and that is going to be the incorporation of little groms. This is going to allow us to take a more defensive posture, kind of let the enemy come to us, and then focus on taking them down with a variety of missiles, right? I think it's a pretty obvious and fairly typical choice, especially if you're coming from Warhammer 2, where ranged and artillery was more or less the meta. Uh, the little grom is quite strong, it has good range, has good accuracy, has armor piercing damage, and can do very good damage to both single entities as well as heavily armored elite infantry. Now, I have three of them here, 
but this is probably the most you ever want to bring, right? We only really need two or three of them in our composition. We'll replace some of the regular cost stars to fit them in. They're expensive, so we don't want to go overboard, but it'll give us a little bit of punching power and again, forces the enemy to come to us. I've also added in some Streltsy here. Whenever you have the funding, you should probably get two to three Streltsy in your army. They're just going to have, like you can see, they have the same missile strength as a regular Kossar, right? But it's armor piercing and they're going to be a better melee competent as well. Of course, they're double the price of Kossars for upkeep on the campaign map, but it's just something to keep in mind. So again, we've got, you know, kind of a st standard front line. We're a little bit more committed into the damage output than we are into the front line with this army, but that's kind of the idea with this sort of composition. And we're going up against Nurgle. Nurgle's got a couple little extra units in here. I'm bringing, having Nurgle bring some flyers because these are going to help harass our missile units and our artillery units, which should give us some problems. So let's see how it plays out. So again, I think that it's easy to underestimate the value of uh, some good frontline units here. I could even see an argument for cutting a little ground from this composition because you could add two armored Kossars to it, have a really stable front line. We also have the Streltsy out on the wings because we're going to want to primarily use these for deflecting these sort of flanking enemy units that are going to be coming in and also because that will allow us to reposition them to then shoot across the front lines once our front lines are engaged. Now, I let the little Grom fire off around initially, and I think that they either targeted the Plague Toads or the Exalted Plague Bears, but you really want to try and manually retarget them, especially if there's trees or something. Make sure that they're hitting targets. You can see after a couple of hits on each of these groups of infantry, they're already down a quarter of their health. It's a decent start, and of course you can always target fire them onto some of these big units, like the large units as well. So with a little bit of spells, some firing from the little Grom, and uh, some firing from our archers, you can see we already pretty easily cut down that. We've got some units coming in on the flank, so we want to try and reposition ourselves here. We don't want to overcommit that armored Kossar to the flank because it's supposed to be a frontline holder. And pretty much the same story with the Patriarchs, the Spellcasters, all of that. Now, once units start to get engaged in the front lines, I typically try to just turn my artillery around and uh, get them to face back and just kind of free fire. It can be a little risky at times, but there's, there's a point where you want to stop micromanaging your artillery and start micromanaging your units, right? Getting these units spread out so they can shoot at the flanks, hitting through the gaps, making sure that we're trying to cast spells on useful spots and take care of any sort of mess. Like, you can see this is... This is a lot of trouble over here, so we want to try to clean this side up quickly and start committing more of these units to the side. Now, you can also see that, uh, I think we missed it a little bit here, but I've had this problem with the little Groms in 1.1. Uh, you know, we had some unit responsiveness issues before this, and I don't know if anybody, if you noticed it while I was while I was doing this, go back a little bit. You saw that I had to manually path out that little ground to turn around. When you just sit them in place, sometimes they refuse to take a target and they just keep shooting. I've had a lot of problems with the little ground where if I try to just, you know, drag click it to point a direction, it doesn't work so well. So just be wary of that. That's, that's the one thing I would have recommended this composition more strongly, but lately I can't. You can't just like tell them to go here, face a certain direction. Uh, they'll do that and they just kind of wiggle back and forth in place. It's kind of a mess. Um, while I've been talking, the army's been doing work. Again, it's really not too much other than just continuing to like reposition and re-engage your units. This armored Kossar, I really should be getting in there to fight because, you know, they don't have any ammunition left. You want to make sure the Streltsy have a good vantage point. Of course, they're taking a lot of damage over here. But this is where the bulk of their forces are remaining, and overall this has been a pretty advantageous fight for us. Strauss, you get the snipe on their lord, that's a big damage debuff to their leadership, and eventually they just rout and we win the battle. So again, I think I think this composition is pretty standard. I think it's pretty safe. Uh, you can see here the their performance it performed extremely well, right? The worst thing that happened was this Streltsy on the flank got bombarded by the flying units and assaulted by the flankers. Uh, but that was the whole point, right? The point was this should have been an army that can flank and surround us, can easily disrupt us with these flying units, and yet we were able to pull through with very minimal losses and some pretty good damage on some of these little Groms, uh, you know. Maybe bringing less of them and more frontliners could be a better option here, like I said, but that's how the composition works. Let's move on to the next one. 
Now the next composition that I'm going to showcase is the inclusion of the Warbear Riders. And again, you can see, you know, I have a pretty standard template of about four armored Kossars and a couple of Patriarchs for line holders, with the rest being regular Kossars. Again, you'll kind of have to gauge this for yourself, what your comfort level is with this, where swapping out a Kossar, like a regular Kossar or two, for an armored Kossar might be to your benefit. Again, approaching the one-to-one -one ratio here. Uh, but in this particular case, you know, we also have the War Bear Riders. And, and while these aren't, you know, strictly line holders, these are going to be melee engagement units. And these are going to be used to kind of preserve our flanks so that we can make the most of the smaller number of line holders and the damage dealers we have. We are going up against the same Nurgle army. Uh, to be honest, I, I could maybe put some soul grinders in here or go more infantry heavy. But really, this this is one of the key strengths of Kislev. The war, this is probably the composition I would legitimately recommend to people out of the three that I'm showcasing here for the mid game. War bear riders, you know, every, people talk about this a lot, but if you have anti-large cavalry, once you kill the enemy large units, your cavalry still function effectively as cavalry, right? They're still going to have a good charge bonus and good speed. So even without anti-infantry cavalry, I can still use war bear riders for rear charges. Of course, against Nurgle, no matter what they're bringing, unless it's a bunch of infantry, your war bear riders are going to do really well. In fact, the biggest problem is if you get your cavalry bogged down in their infantry. Um, but we've got, we're going to be able to counter a lot of the stuff that they have. So let's get into the battle and see how it plays out. So in this case... What I did is position a war bear rider on each of the flanks, kind of kept one in the back, uh, presumably in the case that, you know, you can react easily this way, right? Do they send all of their, you know, kind of monstrous units, their large units onto the flanks, or do they run anything right up the middle? Now, with the case of these plague drones, they're just going to get completely annihilated by my missile units. We've got these Plague Toads of Nurgle moving up the side, and we're going to be able to easily intercept those with the War Bear Riders. We've kind of got the same thing here. You can see I want to keep my some of my units facing forward, but these rear units, I can kind of put them out on the flank facing outwards to help assist with gunfire. Now, I want to be careful because these War Bear Riders are getting a little overwhelmed. We're moving some of our infantry to respond to that flank, but I really should be moving some of these War Bear Riders around to the flank as well, kind of keep things contained. I'm more focused on casting some spells and holding the enemy in place so we can hit them with some different spells. Um, but yeah, we just get some great opportunities with the War Bear Riders. You can see they're going to trade extremely well with some of these other units here. Yeah, and this is why I wanted to keep this one in here because eventually the flying units are going to come through. We want to try to target fire them down, especially with the units that aren't being oppressed, right? We've got these Kossars that are just free to do whatever they please. Uh, we want to try to make sure that we're continuing to cast spells and manage things in that regard as well, uh, using the Patriarch to heal. This is also where, you know, as we approach this stage of the game, having the Patriarchs with heals, that's going to be a very effective tool on the Warbear Riders. In particular, once you get your Patriarch onto the Warbear Mount, it's going to be very useful. Right, so we can see we've already cut down a lot of this stuff. We've got some rot flies in here. We've got some plague drones about to die. This cultist is still alive. We've retargeted these war bear riders onto the plague toads as they tried to ran, and we got them away from enemy plague bears. Now we've got some nurglings here that are kind of holding up some of our war bear riders, which is a great tool for them to use in this case, honestly. And that's why we're going to try to get our war bears around and be able to help someone else. Um, but we're, we're kind of winning here. We're holding out decently in this fight. We're going to have to probably reposition some of our infantry here in order to make better use of them in this particular battle. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of a slugfest here, but it seems like we generally have the advantage. We're able to deal a lot of damage to their units on the outset. And again, you know, we've got like our Patriarch here. He's taking a little damage, but he should have a heal left. We've got a little bit of a Wind Blast there to do some damage. Like, we've just got a little bit of tools. And, and again, now we've got no plague toads no plague bears on this side we should be able to have these war bears come in and assist on this side on the flank so even though we're not going to specialize against these kinds of units right we can still get a pretty devastating charge on these plague bears we've got this cultist of nurgle he's on a cute little mount he's going to get run down by the war bear riders and that's not going to do well for him again we've got these war bear riders here set up as well for another rear charge on this infantry and it turns out we don't even need it because they've already routed and we win so yeah i, I think that i think that it can be difficult to micromanage right using cavalry units 
can kind of be a lot of, you know, it can be difficult for people to work with. It's a little bit harder than the, you know, plant your little Grom and your archers in place and just take care of things. But the, the war bears are just so strong. This is such a strong unit and the kind of stuff that you're going to be fighting against. I mean, even, even when you're going up against an enemy who doesn't really have a lot of monstrous units, like sooner or later you will, right? Norska will upgrade to that. Greenskins will upgrade to that. Skaven won't, but this is still a cavalry unit that's going to be just as effective against Skaven. I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say you shouldn't use the other kind of cavalry, but you can see how this, this is going to be probably the best one size fits all army. It, the danger is if you're not paying attention to your war bear riders and they get caught in melee against something like these exalted plague bears, they're going to take a lot of damage. So it's important to either support them with patriarchs or just make sure that you you pick and choose your engagement and run them away um, but yeah very effective composition and we can see the results here now for our last composition i'm going to be using one where i introduce the light war sleds overall i actually think this is a very versatile unit and i think that you could even incorporate light war sleds into the composition with little groms because they both come from the same building um, we can see we are going to go up against this corn army that I just talked about, so it's going to be a tough one. Here's a situation where I probably could cut some two of these Kossar units and put in a Streltsy. You can see we've got a fair amount of line holders in addition to the heroes and mages. Um, but the key, the key reason that these light war sleds are so good is they're fast enough, their armor is decent, they can survive or perform okay in melee. In fact, you can see they have the anti-infantry bonus for melee, but they also have armor-piercing missiles. So the this is just like the, the cavalry unit like I talked about on the turn one composition. What you do with these light war sleds is not even necessarily engage the enemy, but distract the enemy. You use these to pull away units like a blood shrine of corn, or perhaps even pull some of their infantry off to chase you because they know that their infantry are going to do a lot of damage to you here, but they're not going to catch you. And if you do a really good job of kiting the enemy with some light war sleds, you could get some infantry off in the corner of the map and bring your light war sleds back into the battle, giving you a big advantage. Even if you can't do that, they have a lot of uses. They're a very versatile unit. So let's get into this battle and see how they work. Okay, so we got a standard-ish composition here. Gotta try to spread it wide uh, because again, this is, you know, with shielded units, you're gonna wanna be getting flanks in and they've got a lot of infantry, but they're actually pulling back because they've got the skull cannon here. Now, with these light war sleds, you wanna get them out on the field as quick as possible. You wanna get them to start disrupting and distracting. They're whiffing a lot of these early shots, but that's not even that important because you can see just this initial engagement has already broken them. And despite the fact that I already pathed them out, it was enough to bait the AI. So you can see we can kind of, uh, well, we get caught up. I end up charging into these Chaos Warhounds because we're anti-infantry, but you can see just how much damage that did. We, of course, take a lot of damage. So that's the thing you gotta be careful about. Um, but if you hold shift and drag a line, you can get your, you can kind of draw your compositions out here. But so you can see again, they've committed a lot here, right? Three units to fight my two war sleds, and these blood crushers of corn aren't necessarily specialized against them. The blood shrine of corn isn't specialized against them, and both of these units are actually slower. So this this is a huge win. Even if we have to sacrifice a little war, a light war sled, which you'll see we end up having to do, that's okay. This, this is a good trade for us. I mean, we've already routed their Chaos Warhounds once without really taking any losses. You know, we've got these Blood Crushers kind of chasing us. We're getting some free shots on their Cultus. Uh, anything we can do to distract them. Again, here you can see this Blood Shrine of Corn. I haven't seen something with these sled units. The responsiveness is not very good in this update, I hate to say it. But regardless, while taking virtually no damage, we've almost got this Blood Shrine down to half health. And we have a big opportunity to run in here and hit the Skull Cannon. We're going to have our other War Sleds come back across the middle. And we're kind of tanking the shots from the Skull Cannon, but that is just how life works. Yeah, you can see we get like a nice shot in here, get a nice charge. Sure, we don't have anti-infantry bonus for this Skull Cannon, but we still have the armor piercing for it. And we get a bunch of free bullets in on it, and then we just kind of run away. So again, we got two light War Sleds here who have gotten a half health Blood Shrine a nearly half health skull cannon. Skull cannon's getting some shots off, but thankfully it's targeting our hero and mostly missing. Now, their front line comes in. We've got some low armored units that we really want our Kossars to target down as much as we can. 
if we are paying attention, we want to get the Streltsy onto the Chaos Warriors. We want to make sure we get some spell casting down in order to kind of slow the battle down, defend ourselves here. Um, and, and the problem here is now we don't have a lot of other special tools to hold our line at home. You know, their heroes are going to do really well when they get on top of us. They still have a, a free blood shrine that's running around and doing damage. And you can see it to try to micromanage two different fights happening in two different places. Uh, especially if you're playing on higher difficulties, it's going to be tougher. Um, but again, we have both of these Blood Crushers of Corn and a Blood Shrine of Corn distracted by just two War Sleds. We have the Skull Cannon about to die. We have the Chaos Warhounds routed. We can now send these War Sleds back into this battle. And so as much as we can, we want to kind of... Like, this front line just needs to survive, but... Really, the Blood Crushers of Corn, like these are anti-infantry cavalry. Those are going to kind of specialize in taking us out here. And so we kind of have to sacrifice one war slide here a little bit. We chase a Blood Shrine into battle here. We can then, once we get here, we're able to um, take these units. Like, these still have the anti-infantry and the armor piercing bonus. That's going to serve us great in this fight because it means we can just charge these front lines, right? We're definitely making some sacrifices here, and our armored Cossars are going to be taking a lot of damage. I mean, that's just natural when you're going up against Corn. There's not a whole lot we can do about it. This is also where, again, maybe having some extra Streltsy to be able to focus fire down some of these Blood Shrines and the heroes would be a little bit more useful. But you can see we get some pretty good damage off of that charge. And, and these two Blood Crushers, again, still haven't participated in the battle. We leave this Light War Sled out there as bait. And we just have them shoot at them, put it on skirmish mode, set and forget, and all of a sudden we've won the battle just out of, uh, I don't know, out of sheer dedication and commitment. But so that's that's how the war sleds are used, right? They're an insanely powerful, they're a super powerful distraction tool, but they, beyond just doing distractions, they do damage. And they can deal with a variety of different situations, and they can still make it back to your front lines and get a nice, like, rear charge on their infantry with armor piercing and anti infantry bonus. So, fighting corn is definitely a challenge, especially your front line is going to take some losses. And the Cossars, like, when you're dealing with enemies with a lot of armor, these regular Cossars are, are almost not even worth it. I mean, we still got some pretty good damage value out of one of them, so maybe that's. But you can see, like, compared to the value that we're getting out of these war sleds, it's about appropriate. Um, the Streltsy get really good value here. So it's a, it's a tough fight, but we still come out on top. And that, I think, is a great demonstration of war sleds. That's also the final composition that I'm going to show for the mid-game. So with that, we're going to jump back to the campaign, and we're going to talk about late-game compositions. All right, with the mid-game compositions out of the way, it's time to look at the end-game compositions. There's not really as much to talk about here in terms of buildings, right? Because, like I said, with the late game compositions, we're going to be looking at everything, right? I'm going to consider this a reality that by the late game, you have multiple tier 5 settlements. You have the ability to create whatever buildings you want and essentially recruit any kind of combination of units that you want. Now, our key units here in the late game compositions are going to be Ice Guard and Tsar Guard, right? I think that this is definitely the point. If you haven't already upgraded some of your armored Khazar to Tsar Guard, this is where you want to do it. I think that in the late game, it's important to add more Khazars. I mean, this is turn 175. This is deep in a campaign. Um, but yeah, 26 Patriarch Cap. And to be honest, that's, that's probably low. I could probably boost it a little bit more than I already have it. Um, but point being, you can afford a lot of heroes. You can afford a lot of heroes. For six armies, I have 26 Patriarchs available. That's a lot. Putting extra Patriarchs in armies is important. Ice Guard is important. Tsar Guard is important, right? Ice Guard are basically upgrades to any sort of ranged units. We will still see some Streltsy where it's applicable. Uh, and otherwise, we're mostly going to be keeping the same format, right? We're going to see kind of a Siege Artillery little Grom-focused one. We're going to see another composition where we incorporate the Light War Sleds. And we're going to see a composition with the War Bear Riders. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but... I don't really bring, I haven't, I haven't quite found a use for elemental bears, I suppose. They're, they're expensive, they're slow, they're really strong, but they're hard to manage. And, you know, how often do you go up against something where this is justified? I would say maybe bringing one is fine at times. Uh, if you're playing as Boris Ursa specifically, of course, uh, I think that like, like four patriarchs, two elemental bears and Boris and like a tempest maiden is literally all you need. That's a doom stack in and of itself. It can just clear anything. 
Uh, I don't have Griffin Legion in anything, specifically because they're anti-infantry. We already talked about this with the War Bear Riders. I, I, it's not that I don't see a composition where a Griffin Legion can work and can do things, um, but I just don't see it working quite as well as the War Bear Riders. And we also aren't bringing in heavy war sleds, uh, just because they're. I think the purpose that light war sleds are supposed to serve they're just better, right? It, it's the speed. It's the speed difference that I think is the biggest thing, right? If your heavy war sleds aren't fast enough and they just get too bogged down in what they're doing, they're going to suffer. So those are some of the ideas we're working with here in the late game. Let's look at some of the compositions. All right. So for our first composition, uh, it's the, the upgrade to the war bears composition. I think war bears are one of, if not the most valuable unit in the Kislev roster. Okay. Ice Guard are great, they're really powerful. Zarguard, amazing stats. And of course, flooding your army with Patriarchs, also very good. Your heroes are very good. Um, but in terms of like the most important unit in the game or one of the most effective, I really do think it is the War Bear Riders. Uh, and we'll see We'll see in terms of performance comparing this to other ones, uh, but also in terms of versatility. I've been showing these in field battles, right? To, to try and give like an example of here's how to try to keep the matchups neutral, right? To come as close to like neutral baseline as I can get, showing things in as much of an even light as I can. Uh, the big thing to keep in mind is when we come to settlement battles, Little Grom are, are gonna be a little bit restrictive in how they perform, right? They're gonna be good for knocking down like towers, walls, but they're not necessarily gonna get full value. And same thing with uh, light war sleds, right? Maybe could be used for like kind of a sneaky flank into the enemy backline, but definitely like they're not just, they're just not going to be at quite as effective as I think war bear riders. And these are just, there's just a strong tool. You just face so many like large units, right? If we're fighting Nurgle, if we're fighting ogres, if we're fighting corn, right? Uh, even even Zinch, some of the more dangerous Zinch units are their large single entity monsters or things like, you know, the Exalted Flamers, right? Or even just the regular, like the Flamers, it, being able to take those down really easily, really effectively. Key piece of it. Anyway, I've talked about it a lot. We've got a simple com uh, composition here, right? We've got War Bear Riders for the flanks, a couple of Tsar Guard for holding the line, and of course a bunch of Ice Guard for dealing damage. We've also got the Patriarchs. We are going up against an Ogre Kingdom's composition. Obviously, this is going to be an easy fight and an easy win for the War Bears composition. Uh, but of course, that's that's kind of the point, right? Like this, this is still a good Ogre's army. It's going to cost just as much. It's going to cost more than ours do, actually. And I could probably throw some upgrades on these War Bears, right? Um, but this, you'll see, we'll see how this plays out. But we should have a pretty overwhelming victory here, despite like an even matchup in terms of strength. So let's take a look. So the Ogres are just going to hold their position because I did give them a couple of artillery. I do kind of tend to see this like Iron Blaster and Scrap Launcher combo come in for them. And you can see it already has done a great deal of damage. Flock of Doom going to just really wreck us. Now, if you notice, when I start to use War Bears in the late game, I actually kind of like to stick some of the Patriarchs with them, right? We've got, and I actually messed this up in this fight, but I would say like a Patriarch with the heal. And then the Patriarch with the attack boost, or maybe the Patriarch with the vigor bonus, depending on if you took, if you're bringing one up from the early game where you might have taken that. Uh, but you can see, right, they're bringing these crushers out to the flank here, and those are just going to get obliterated by this. Uh, no, no chance, right? No shot. So we're pushing, we're positioning our war bears on the flanks. We're going to be able to counter their flanks extremely easily, and then be able to target down whatever we like. It's also kind of drawing them out. They're wasting magic. They're wasting all sorts of spells. We're going to push up and take a nice little position here in the center with our infantry. These ice guard are going to slow the ogres, which is going to be really critical to us. They're still going to do pretty decent damage. And uh, here you can see I realized that I put uh, two healing patriarchs on the same side instead of one healer, one buffer. So we're trying to switch that up. And of course, having Patriarchs on War Bear is really powerful. Even having your Lord, um, like Frost Maiden, on a War Bear, really effective. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, you can see we're taking some pretty serious damage. You can see where you know one of the weaknesses of Kislev is, despite the fact that you know archers are supposed to be good against infantry, and we have great line holders in the Tsar Guard. The problem with infantry is they're still going to be vulnerable to enemy charges, fast units, to monstrous units, to artillery, and to magic. So this composition can take a lot of damage you know, in the initial stages of the fight or before the fight even begins. So this ogre's roster could be difficult without the war bears, right? If we're just trying to hold the line and fight them down with missiles, we're going to have a lot of issues, right? 
Uh, but you can see, right, we've kind of put out their Lord in the Fire Belly. I have no idea why they thought this was a good fight. We already have basically obliterated one of the Crusher's units. We've got the other ones kind of bogged down in the middle. Having the War Bear Riders with the mass to pin things in place is really good. And you can see how not having this War Bear Rider actively supporting our right flank is causing it to basically just crumble. It's quite weak. Um, but overall, you know, we've decimated things on the western flank, pull the war bears out to try to rearrange them, enemies already starting to fall in morale, we could be dropping healing buff, we could be dropping either the attack boost or the vigor uh, buff, and now we can kind of try to reposition here so that our war bear riders, the patriarchs can sweep back across, maybe send the war bears out to intercept some things, trying to target fire down the stone horn on the hunter, which is just still doing ridiculous damage. They've got the Scrap Launcher and the Iron Blaster in the back line still doing some good damage. Um, but overall, right, there you end up, we, we deflected the left flank, now we deflected the right flank, and all there is left to do is to just clean up a couple of little things, and the battle's over. So we definitely took some damage on our line holders, took a little bit of damage on our, you know, missile infantry here. But you can see the Patriarchs surviving, getting the heals out, and just the insanity value from these War Bears, right? These, these really are a key component, and... I think that this is probably the best Kislev composition for the late game. It's what I'd recommend. I I think that little Groms are good, but they're not good enough. And too much of that kind of relies on chance, right? They generally are pretty accurate, but they're not perfectly accurate. Light War Sleds are great, but they're not faster than everything in the late game, and they require heavy micromanagement. War Bear Riders, you can just kind of clump them up with your Patriarchs, pop a heal buff down, send them in, and just do devastating damage. But that's it for this composition. We do still have two more to look at, though, so let's move on to the next one. Now, the next composition we have, I've incorporated some little Groms into, and, and you can see, you know, after a little bit of play testing with this composition, you know, I like to keep the, the Patriarchs still, great line holders, and have the healing on them, but... Even with this, right, we're going up against, I'm going up against Nurgle here. They're going to have some single entity monsters. They're going to have some flying units, you know, a good amount of uh, infantry to rush our front lines as well. And really, this is still where, you know, I talked about this before, where if you are, if you're having a tough time with the battle or they're getting through to your units, it, it is better to have enough line holders to make sure that something like this can't fully break through. I have Ice Guard with swords in here. But after playing through this, I do actually think that it'd be better to swap these out for the Ice Guard with Glaives, right? While it's nice to have this anti-infantry bonus on these, and um, be able to kind of get in and do some damage, right? The Swords units, you can see, have a much better melee attack, like 10 more melee attack than the Ice Guard with Glaives. Uh, the Ice Guard with Glaives are still going to survive better against things like a flank from the Pox Riders or Plague Toads, right? Or things like the Plague Drones hitting them in the back line. So that's why that's where the glaives really come in handy you don't want to be engaging these in melee you want them to be doing damage but if they have to get engaged in melee uh, you want the glaives so anyway we're going to try to protect our core we're going to try to get some damage with the groms we're going up against nurgle so some of these are slow moving um, but this is going to be really hard to deal with if they get to our front lines let's see how it plays out so we start off pretty standard checkerboard formation we're going to try to protect our flanks with the tsar guard as much as we can so you can put the patriarchs in for some reason, uh, Nurgle decides not to march out right away. He thinks that the Soul Grinder is going to get us. And uh, in fact, when I had three Groms, he would move right away. I don't really know what triggers that, but uh, we're going to get a bunch of free shots into their Exalted Plague Bears. At long range, I usually tend to try and focus either like mass infantry, like some of their clumped elite infantry. That way, if, even if you're a little less accurate with your shots, still likely to do damage. I think maybe some like monstrous uh, infantry or cavalry can be good targets too. Uh, the question is how fast moving are they flying units of course you want them to die and these are large but they're going to be hard to hit with your groms but when you get the chance i do like to you know once stuff starts getting closer it's really nice to get these little groms on some of the single entity monsters starts dealing out some damage and i kind of swap one of these units around it's taking damage from the artillery uh, we want to position ourselves so that we can intercept the flank more easily and have some of these units start firing at them without really having to manually target them getting rushed in front here but that's where the patriarchs come into play All right we cast a little bit of an ice sheet slow up their advances we buff up the patriarchs and send them in trying to wash the flanks as well make sure we don't get overwhelmed there of course they do a summon right in the front we've got zargar to intercept that coming in with the plague drones and the pox riders flank here as well 
I do have this one unit of Ice Guard Blaze in the back, just to, in case it needs to go into melee on the Chariots. And so here you can see we, we kind of got lucky. They mostly laid in on our Tsar Guard. We have one coming in, but I put an Ice Guard flank on the side, so they're at least going to do pretty well in melee there. And we can kind of group these Tsar Guard up. We can get the Patriarchs in combat. As much as you can, you want to keep a close eye on the Patriarchs here. Try to micro them and run them around. Again, they're on Warbear mounts, so keeping them mobile and doing some, uh, doing, making sure you get charges in here and there is important. Drop a Heart of uh, Heart of Winter because they just have a huge value and huge amount of troops there. So you can get a lot of value off of that. I don't know if get to see it here. It doesn't look too crazy right now. I'm not sure if we're actually getting a readout on that. Well, regardless, you can see it's it's causing pretty heavy damage to a lot of them, slowing them down, buying us some time. We're doing pretty well on the western flank. I do want to try to reposition the little ground speed here and there, um, but you can see they're doing some good damage to the pretty clean one. Eventually get them on the plague bearers while those are sitting out still doing their range attacks. Um, despite taking some pretty severe damage over here on the side, we are managing to repel a lot of these pox riders and some of these other flying units and flankers, monsters of infantry. Mostly what we have left to deal with is a lot of the single entity stuff, and so that's why I tried to focus down this great unclean one fairly early on. Right, this exalted great unclean one is actually going to be pretty tanky and survivable in melee. We've got, you know, the Beast of Nurgle here as well, but we've taken out a lot of their, like, monstrous units, right? Their monstrous uh, flying units, their monstrous infantry, the war beasts, I guess they technically are, and now we can try to start to focus fire down some of these more vulnerable targets. We did actually lose a Patriarch here, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so like I said, it, it's important to try to keep moving them, right? You don't want the Patriarchs necessarily in extended fight, and despite the fact that they are anti-large, you know, they're still going to get mobbed and beaten down by enough of a, a good enough, strong enough force. I would think in your campaigns, they're not going to have as much of a survivability problem because you're going to be able to upgrade their stats and get their stat line a lot more effective than they're going to be in this custom battle. That's why we see some of the... Oh no, they do live here. It's probably the next battle that we lose one then. Uh, and of course, if you really, if you want to be that guy, which I'm going to be that guy here to demonstrate it, one of the benefits of having a heal left over at the end of the fight is that you can throw it down once all your units get clumped up and you can heal them all pretty easily. Right, like we're still waiting for the soul grinder, move some of our weakened units back just to be safe. We pop a heal down and if you look at the health of our heroes, they're in pretty good shape here, right? So it's very easy to kind of survive. We brought a lot of frontline and damage was pretty well distributed between frontline, backline, and heroes. That looks really good, right? This is a solid outcome. Despite the fact that little groms are good, it doesn't make sense to overinvest in them when you're making this kind of composition. And uh, you can see how important it was to have enough line holders, uh, to have a couple of good hero units. And, and again, the damage was pretty evenly distributed. So I would say that that's a great success. Now, the last composition I'm going to show is again going to be bringing in the light war sleds. Uh, again, I think that the reason that these stay relevant is for the same reason they were relevant earlier on. These are just a great distraction tool, and they're going to provide a lot of damage value. They're almost like sacrificial pawns. They're going to require a little bit more micromanagement on the field, uh, but being able to successfully distract enemy units is great. It's what their purpose is. Now, I'm also bringing in some Streltsy here because this time I've decided to go up against a corn roster, right? We've got some cavalry, we've got some monstrous infantry, we've got some regular infantry, magic chariots, more infantry, uh, and even a bloodthirster here. Now, this is going to be a really tough fight. It's going to end kind of poorly. Again, remember to keep in mind the flexibility of your compositions. Bringing in some Streltsy to deal with somebody like Korn, who has a lot more heavily armored units, is probably going to be important. And we're going to see they're going to get some pretty good value, especially on their infantry. I think it's important to try to use them like Streltsy and Ice Guard to focus fire down some of the bigger threats, some of these Minotaurs maybe when they're coming up, or the Blood Shrines. I don't do a good enough job of that in this fight, as you'll see. But part of the problem is trying to make sure that you're micromanaging everything, right? Patriarchs and War Sleds and target firing while making sure your formation doesn't collapse and heroes don't get sniped. That's a lot. It's a lot to work with. It's a big ask. Um, but of course, if you're competent, if, if you, even if you're more competent than me at performing the actual battles, I do still think that the light war sleds are good. Again, I don't bring the heavy war sleds because they're just a little bit slower. And we're actually going to see that kind of come into play here in this fight a little bit uh, where the light war sled doesn't even have enough speed. But anyway, 
I, I want to make one last note. This fight's going to be rough. It, we're going to win it, but it's going to be really rough. And this is probably the kind of enemy composition that I think the War Bear Riders would actually do better against. But let's let's go into the battle first and then talk about the rest of these things. So you got Streltsy kind of on the front lines and the flanks. Make sure their sight lines are relatively unobstructed. We've got the Ice Guard to slow things down. We've got the Patriarchs off on the corners. And we're going to try to do the same thing with the war sleds, sending them out to distract units on the flanks. Now, we'll see how that goes. The problem is, so this war sled, technically faster than all these units, still gets caught by it. Sad to see. But it's not faster than that bloodthirster, right? And on this flank, you can see they actually ignore us. But you can also see the price of ignoring us, right? Two war sleds, we've almost got a blood shrine of corn dead completely. And with the way that flying units work versus ground units, that bloodthirster is at least going to have a hard time chasing and dealing damage successfully. Now, I focus fire the Streltsy on some of these Chaos Warriors of Corn. I'm kind of thinking I might have wanted to focus the Ice Guard more on the Minotaurs here. That's what I would say is one of my big shortcomings in this fight. And of course, we get the Patriarchs in here. We get some buffs rolling out. But here is also where, like I talked about, you want to be careful with these kind of units because we're about to get mobbed here. I'm not going to pay enough attention to it. I'm trying to get these war sleds into position. I'm trying to keep this war sled running as much as I can, which you can see I'm not doing a great job of right now. But even so, it's doing some decent damage to this Bloodthirster. So we're trying to pop down spells, trying to keep everything alive. This Patriarch's getting absolutely slapped between the Minotaurs and the infantry that are in there, plus the, uh, I think there's a, yeah, the Blood Reaper that's in there. Bad times. We also have a really heavily exposed western flank. We have the Patriarchs push out to chase some things down. They really need to get back in there. But this is a good opportunity for us to lay down some spells as well if we can. You can just see this is... I've talked about this already. I really think that Korn is just has the advantage against Keyslev in this matchup. And so when we're doing these multiplayer battles, it's kind of hard to, to get a really good showcase of how to balance things well. But you can see... If we can uh, keep putting out damage, and maybe this might be a good example of where I should have brought more line holders as well. Replacing a couple of Ice Guard with a couple of Tsar Guard to hold these units at bay more. Um, but being able to get this damage with the War Sluts kind of for free, probably charging them in here. You can see it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to micromanage, it's a lot to keep control of. I'm more focused on trying to hold the center and reposition my units here. So yeah, it's really perhaps not a good replay, but still we get some good examples of some of the ideas here, right? This this bloodthirster despite the fact that it's faster than these war sleds staying out of the fight chasing them across the map and taking sincere damage right like this thing is is taking about as much damage as these war sleds do so that's a pretty good trade right with some good focus fire we actually take down their exalted bloodthirster lord we've got some of their chariots and things on the retreat we finally get some units distracted by these war sleds and take some of the heat off of our front lines or well off of our infantry mass which is good because we've had a lot of things route we need to regroup we need to retarget some of these enemies but if we can keep kind of routing some of this stuff we'll be able to eventually pull the battle into our favor uh, again this is where with the low health of these patriarchs this is where that heal is just critical right all of the different heroes being low on health taking a lot of damage you know war bears giving them armor speed and having the anti-large isn't always enough but if we can kind of group things up and uh, keep them moving right having this frost maiden sit there that didn't really help us Again, these light war sleds really should be cycle charging. Uh, and you can see this is where it gets to be a little bit much for me when I'm trying to you know, keep this one war sled alive on the flank and also make sure that we don't totally collapse in the center. It's a really cluster of a battle. I think corn is really tough. And again, I think that this is where we could see some more advantage from the war bears being able to counter stuff like minotaurs, um, even probably bloodthirsters if we're hitting them hard enough. Uh, some of the, a lot of the corn cavalry, which is designed to be anti-infantry, is going to die horribly to our war bears, which of course are anti-large. And despite the fact that we lost the war sled, you can see the bloodthirster does not stay in this world for much longer, and we win the fight. Certainly a pyrrhic victory, uh, no doubt, no argument from me on that one. Take a lot of damage across the board. We lose a war sled. We lose a patriarch. Again, I would think in your campaign, your patriarchs are going to have a better stat line by this point from all your upgrades. Uh, but even our Streltsy take a lot of damage. And and again, this is kind of what I was talking about where, you know, even after playing this out, I thought this was good. But on reflection, we probably would want to swap out some of these Ice Guard for more Tsar Guard. Being able to actually hold the front lines and contain things is going to be a bit more important. So... 
That brings us to the end of our late game composition. Again, I, I just want to say that I think that this war bear. I think that the war bear composition, we'd probably want to swap out some of these ice guard for some streltsy. But this is what's going to carry you. This, this I think, is one of the better compositions, if not the best composition or type of composition to use. The, the War Bear is your cornerstone unit, especially against an enemy like Korn. You can see out of this, like out of their endgame roster of units, how many of these are large, right? So being able to bring a lot of War Bears to counter that is going to be useful. But what are some other things that we've learned here? One of the things, and probably the most important thing I've talked about here, is the flexibility of the of the Kislev roster, right? Depending on if you're going up against a slower enemy, shifting more into artillery and a defensive playstyle. If you're playing against a fast or aggressive enemy, bringing the kinds of units that are going to distract and delay them, right? Or just in general, once you get towards the late game, bringing War Bear Riders. If you they have high armor, bringing Streltsy. If they have low armor, bringing more Ice Guard and Kossars, right? Uh, we've also talked about how they have kind of a, what I'd consider a standardized formation. You know, I, I and again, this comes into play with the flexibility of increasing or reducing your front line, trading it out for some of the weaker units. But in general, you know, I think this is a pretty standard, like, baseline composition for Kislev. This is your all-rounder unit, and this is where you fill in a couple of Streltsy or a couple of War Bears or maybe a couple little Groms depending on who you're going up against or even what your comfort level is, right? You you start filling in a few of those specialty units depending on who you're playing as, who you're fighting, and again, what your personal comfort level or preferred play style is. And I think that's one of the strengths of the Kislev roster, right? There's a couple of key units that you can focus on. Trying to get research for things like Kossars out really early is going to really help boost your economy. Being able to pick the perks for them on a character skill tree is probably something that I'd recommend because these are going to be viable for a long period of time. I can see where eventually you will want Tsar Guard and Ice Guard, right? And, and I think that there's clear upgrade paths here too, where you have some kind of specialty units to tech into, but otherwise, right, the armored Kossars go into Tsar Guard, right? The regular Kossars go into Ice Guard. So you kind of have, I think you have a fairly clear path from the early game to mid game to end game here. And of course, another strength of theirs is their heroes. Uh, magic is very strong in this game as in any other. You can get Frostmaid and Tempest with special per like special traits through the Ice Court training to make them even stronger or more specialized to the units. And being able to get a bunch of Patriarchs means that even in that corn battle, we took a lot of damage, right? But with three Patriarchs that all have the Casualty Replenishment bonus skill on them, you're going to be able to recover very rapidly from any of these kinds of fights. Not to mention that they have that healing ability, Salyak's Lullaby, which, you know, it took a little convincing to, to get me on board with it, but even though it has limited uses, you probably won't burn through all those uses in the course of a single fight, and so it can really help your survivability, it increases the strength of your heroes, and it allows you to just bring more heroes and once you have a nice stack of patriarchs rolling around with your war bears, it can be very strong. So I think that covers everything that I wanted to for this campaign army composition guide for Kislev. Uh, it's a new game. It's a new day. Got all kinds of new tactics and strategies. So of course, I really look forward to your comments in the section below. What kinds of units do you like? What do you not like? What are some compositions you think I might have overlooked? Or do you really like Griffin Legion and you're about to try to sell me on them? I'd love to hear from you. Uh, otherwise, if you have any other questions, please leave them in the comment section below as well. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, you know, I love writing essays to people who ask, you know, two sentence question. You know me. Now, I also want to thank you for watching. Uh, I want to try to keep working on these videos and of course we're gonna have to probably revise this one once we get Immortal Empires and we see how the map shapes up, who we're fighting up against, and what kinds of changes to the composition there might be. And of course, once we get some more DLC and we add some more overpowered units, then it shakes up the roster composition entirely. But until then, thank you for watching, have a great day, and we'll see you on the next one.